Amen. Trust and obey. That's a great introduction to uh, what we're looking at here this morning in the last part of John chapter 10. We see this last part of John chapter 10. Our Lord comes back to the image of the shepherd and his sheep, which he used in the first part of chapter 10. And it closes out this section that began way back in chapter 7. Our Lord has revealed some marvelous truths about himself here in this section. He's told us in chapter 7 and verse 38, you recall that he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, by the way, what scripture says that? That out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Ezekiel 36. Uh, one of the chapters that prophesies the new covenant talks about a, a new heart will I give you and, and this life. But it's a, it's a description, as John goes on to tell us, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ who is in us and, and will flow out of us. And largely, that living water is the words of of life of the gospel and other scriptures that we share with others not only our change life our character but our words it's important I, I heard twice this week on Christian radio uh, obviously these teachers were trying probably to make an emphasis but they were they diminished what we said in order to emphasize a changed character. They said, it's more important what you do than what you say. But that is unbiblical, <laughs> if I may say it gently, and <laughs> but in the way of correction. It's important what you do and what you say. You shall be justified by you, the things you say, and you shall be condemned by the things you say. The scripture says, in Matthew, that, that when we share it, we're to live the gospel, but we're also to share it, that we testify because, as Peter says, we're to speak forth. Part of the reason why we've been delivered from the, the domain of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his marvelous light is that we might declare, set forth his excellencies, the one who called us out. We've been given a tongue, we've been given a lips. Most of us, I mean, some of us have, have, may have a speak, uh, speaking impediment of some kind, and of course that wouldn't apply there, but most of us don't have that situation, and so we're to speak forth. Not only live it, but share it verbally. I think that's part of what the Lord's saying here, picturing living water. Living water refreshes. The Word of God refreshes others, lost people that need to hear from us. And then... You remember our Lord demonstrated in chapter 8 and verse 12 that he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Now what is darkness then? Error, evil, wrong thinking, worldliness. They shall not walk in. That is, walking in is a picture of living in. They shall not live in the domain or under the dominion of sin and darkness. Why? Because we've been set free. <laughs> and the light of the world has come into us and we understand truth now. Now, we don't understand every detail of the Word of God yet. We're growing. But we understand more now than we did a week ago, I hope. And then we did a year ago, and definitely 10 years ago, right? There's a progression in our understanding as we walk in the light, as He is in the light, and are conformed into His image. Wow, what a statement. But have the light of life. And of course, that leads Him to say in verse 31 and 32, if you abide in My word, that is, you, if you abide in the light, you are My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth which is another way of saying you shall know him because he is the truth, right? John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? So, and you shall know me, the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
free. No longer a slave. I look back at those days before I knew the Lord. I was religious in some of those days, not all of them. But I was still a slave. But I didn't know it then. <laughs> but looking back, I can see what a bondage it was. And it's, it's a condemned, awful existence. <laughs> to live as a slave to the law of sin and death. And to be set free from that, beloved, I don't want to go back under it. As Paul will say in Romans 6, God forbid that we would even entertain the thought of being under sin anymore. We've been set free. And of course, the whole story of the blind man in chapter 9 illustrates that. And then our Lord in the earlier part of chapter 10 gets very clear. Now he's exposing. You remember what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 about children of light? Right? You want to see it with your own eyes? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 and following. It's so important what characterizes children of light. One of the things that children of light do is they expose evil and darkness, you see. And you don't even have to say anything. All you have to do is be present there if the Holy Spirit's in you. Follow with me, verse 8. Ephesians 5, 8, For you were once darkness. I remember as a young Christian reading that and thinking, Paul, no, what you mean is you were once in darkness. Well, we were in darkness, but darkness was in us too. We were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Same thing John 8, 12 says, right? For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Where do you find what is acceptable to the Lord? Right here in the Word of God, right? That's one of the reasons why we spend time consistently in the Word of God. And then notice verse 11, and have no fellowship, no koinonia with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. That's not fun because they're going to turn on you when you expose them. That's what they did to our Lord. That's what we're seeing happen right here. They, twice in this section, they picked up stones to stone him. Twice in this section, chapter 7 through 10, they sought to arrest him. But they weren't able to. They, weren't, they won't be able to arrest or stone you or me either until it's our time. If that's what the Lord wants us to do, to die for his name in persecution, then so be it. That's up to him. He goes with us through it anyway. Most of us probably won't have to experience that. If I were speaking to your grandchildren, I wouldn't say that statement because I think they may likely see that, the way things are going in government and in the world system today. But for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them, the people in darkness, and they always do it in secret, see. Isn't it strange? And you and I remember this from our old days that they think because they do it in the dark that God won't see them. As if he couldn't see in the dark like he can see in the light, which the Bible says all the way through, God sees in the night as well as he sees in the day. But there's this strange thing about what sin does and the wrong thinking of people. They think, well, and that's why, you know, that they're all out there doing it from sundown until sun up and and you know, it's interesting at five in the morning that, you know that road gets real quiet but from midnight to five man there's all kinds of activity going up and down this road out here it's busy and and they're they're traveling to their places thinking that god doesn't see them and so they'll be safe he won't judge them for what they're doing our lord jesus came into this world and he exposed sin and evil and darkness. And that's what's happening here in chapters 7 through 10 of John. And so our Lord uses the figure of the thief and the robber, and he uses the figure of the stranger in chapter 10, verse 
5, he uses the picture again of the thief and the robber in verse 8, and then he uses the picture of the hireling in verse 12, and then the wolf in verse 12, and none of those are good. <laughs> but he says, the sheep, his people, don't hear them. The sheep won't follow the stranger for long. They may get fooled for a little bit, but they'll recognize because they're comparing what the stranger is saying with the word of God and they'll say that's not the shepherd speaking through that one I'm going to pull back right and the hireling which is probably in this picture the rabbis you know the bible teachers of the first century in Judaism when they see the wolf coming they flee because they don't care about the sheep the sheep aren't theirs and the, sheep, and the wolf comes in and scatters the sheep. I am the good shepherd. So he finishes that discourse and in verses 19 to 21 there's this confusion that we've seen already in chapter 7 and in chapter 8. There was a division again among the Jews. There's some that follow and some that, that are not sure. And that's where we pick up in verse 22. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem. You remember in chapter 7 it was the Feast of Tabernacles in chapter 7 verse 2 and now and, and that continues all the way till chapter 10 verse 21. We're still at the Feast of Tabernacles until chapter 10 verse 21 and then John says but now I'm attaching another story here that follows. Tabernacles would be in October. Feast of Dedication is Hanukkah that's in December. It was actually the 14th of December in 30 AD. And so there's a couple of months in between. And in fact, the Gospel of Luke, chapters 10 through 13, occur in that two-month window. That's where Luke spends time focusing on that section there. But John skips over a couple of months and moves to the Feast of Dedication because John's addressing our Lord's ministry to the people of Jerusalem. The people who had the word of God and should have received him more so than anyone on the planet. The temple was there. It was still standing. The priesthood was there. The whole rabbinical system, both main schools, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel, and they had long tradition and history and, and so the Lord comes there. By the way, it's kind of interesting. What is it that you notice occurs in Jewish homes at Hanukkah? What did they do to display that it's Hanukkah? They put lights in the window, right? And there are nine lights in the Hanukkah candle. There are seven in the menorah that goes in the temple, but there are nine in the Hanukkah candle. But it's interesting. He just said, I'm the light of the world two months earlier, and here they, it's the feast of lights. <laughs> Now, what are they celebrating at Hanukkah? Anybody remember? Breaking the glass. The Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Remember the abomination of desolation. He was the Greek general that got that segment of the empire of Alexander the Great. He got Syria and the Middle East, and there came a time in 167 B.C., 167 years before well 160 years before the Lord that he defiled the temple the temple that Nehemiah and Ezra had built and he put an image of Zeus over the bronze altar to worship it and and that maintained for three years from 167 to 164 and then Judas Maccabeus and others raised a revolt went in there, cleansed the temple, destroyed all of that, restored the temple worship, and it maintained that way until our Lord's coming. So they celebrated. It was a time of liberation and restoring the temple back. It was a great time of national uh, independence and restoration. And they were, it was a celebrated time. So our Lord, in a sense, is acknowledged. He comes into that Jerusalem during that feast and it was winter that's what we'd expect in December and I love this verse 23 and despite 
attempts to kill him that were made in chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10, Jesus walked in the temple. <laughs> you see, he's in full control. He walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now, Solomon's porch was a section of the temple outside of the beautiful gate, a colonnaded section that uh, Herod the Great built on the Temple Mount there. It, it was destroyed by the Romans, so you can't see that today. You can see where it was, but, but they destroyed that section and used it to build probably the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But either way, our Lord is walking there. The early church met in Solomon's porch, remember? After Acts chapter three and four, that's where they were meeting because it was a shaded area, colonnaded, a roof over it, and open to the temple platform. So look what happens. It's interesting, by the way, if you want to think about the structure of this last part of chapter 10, verses 22 to 26 shows opposition to the Lord, and then verses 27 to 30, our Lord affirms those who are His. And then verses 31 to 39, the hardness of heart of the opposition is exposed again. And then verses 40 to 42, those who are receiving him. So there's that, what we call interchange. It moves from opposition to those who receive him to opposition to those who receive him in four parts. So here are the ones that are opposing him. I've titled this section, You Don't Play Around With God. Remember this. If you've been sharing the gospel with someone for a long time, you don't play around with God. Look what happens. Verse 24, then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, they would love to have arrested him, but they were scared to do that. How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Messiah, the Christ, tell us plainly. How many times does he have to tell them and show to them, see? But this is what someone who is in opposition to the Lord and really doesn't believe in him but they're indicating that they're open to following him if he would reveal himself, right? This is a game. They're pretending, and they're pretending that they really want to know when they don't want to know. They've already made up their minds that they want to kill him. But they're pretending that they're interested. Why are you keeping us in doubt? You notice how our Lord does. When he's with, in chapter 4, with the woman in Samaria, the woman at the well, he tells her plainly, I who speak to you and the Messiah, I am he. And there are other times in his ministry where, when he's in areas where people are away from Jerusalem that don't have as much light and understanding of the truth, he gives them more information. That's still true today. But for people who have had a lot of exposure, like in Jerusalem, to the truth of God, to whom much is given, much is required. That's the principle. They had enough information to believe in it. They are simply hardening their hearts. And so that's what he says in verse 25. I told you, and you do not believe. See, I told you already, and you do not believe. And he'll say that to him at the great white throne too, won't he? These people who have had information to believe and wouldn't believe. I told you already, and you don't. you're choosing not to believe. Brother was saying that earlier, the hymn, Trust and Obey, teaches that. There's responsibility. Part of being made in the image and likeness of God is human responsibility. And that's one of the things that so-called Calvinism tries to take away from the, the whole picture and why it's so dangerous, you see. Calvinism says God is sovereign. Every, every Christian believes that. You don't have to be a Calvinist to believe in the sovereignty of God. But sovereignty of God does not take away human responsibility. The Bible is replete with that. And you take that away from someone, you take away their opportunity for salvation because they don't know they need to respond. They do need to respond. These Jewish rulers needed to respond. 
They had a lot of information. Look what he says. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Now turn, hold your finger here and turn back. You remember when we were in chapter 5? Our Lord said this very thing in verse 36 of chapter 5. I have a greater, this was that section where he has five witnesses to who he is in verse 36, the third one of the five. I have a greater witness than John's, that is in John the Baptist, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do. He's talking about the miracles. Okay? Which John tells us at the end of his book that if I tried to write down all the miracles he did, there wouldn't be enough books to fill them. That's how many. We only have a sample here in the four Gospels. A small sample. He was doing that every day in his earthly ministry. He says, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. That was way back earlier. In the same city in Jerusalem, he said that to the religious leaders. Now he says it again. And by the way, this section in chapter 10, 22 to 42 is our Lord's last word of testimony to the religious leaders until Passion Week. So from December of 29 AD till April of 30 AD Passion Week, he doesn't go back to Jerusalem. This is his, his last testimony to them here. So it's sobering to think about in that light, isn't it? So he says, the, the very works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But notice verse 26, but you do not believe. Now here is the God of the universe looking down into their hearts. You and I can't see into hearts, but God can. He says, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, two months before. You're not of my fold of sheep. You've chosen to rebel against me, to not follow my instruction. You remember in Proverbs how many times wisdom cries out, my son, my daughter, listen to me, follow me, heed instruction. Seek me as you seek for a hidden treasure. It says in Proverbs 2 and in Proverbs 4. Seek wisdom. And that's the great message. That's the great need of the hour, isn't it? In the information age in which we live. And so our Lord, I believe, closes that section out there and then begins in verse 27 to 30 to talk about how secure his own sheep are. Because he just said in verse 26, you're not of my sheep. You're demonstrating that. Verse 27 my sheep, and notice there are three things here, but again, human responsibility. <laughs> you see, there's a response here. He says, my sheep, the first thing is, they do what? Hear my voice. They hear my voice. <laughs> that word hear is the idea of hearing and responding with faith. It has an element of action to it. It's not just listening, it's hearing. You know, we can listen to a lot of things and not really, they go back to what we say, one out in one ear and out the other. When we hear something, that means we're focusing on it and we're reacting to it. They hear my voice. You mean a literal voice? No. His voice in the scriptures. They hear scripture and recognizes that it's the voice of God. Have you ever been with someone you're sharing the gospel with and seen this happen? We kind of use the expression, the light goes on <laughs> in their minds and you see it in their eyes. You see their face light up. It's very special. It's a miracle. It's the new birth. It's the miracle. They're coming to life spiritually. And it's a very special experience to see. He says, they hear my voice and I know them. There's a personal relationship between the shepherd and the disciple. I know them like Adam knew Eve, his wife. <laughs> there is a close, dependent, loving, intimate relationship with our Lord. My. And once you've had that, 
you don't want to go back to worldly religion. <laughs> no worldly religion comes even close to this. Kind of what Brother started the morning out with, with face to face. Moses experienced on the mountain to be in the presence of the living God and know it and not become a human wick <laughs> as Nadab and Abihu to be able to still be alive <laughs> and not be burned up. And we would have to be burned up like Nadab and Abihu if we didn't have the blood. Mm. See, they went in without the right incense. They approach the throne of God without, well, let's say their own way, like so many in the world want to do. So he says, they hear my voice and I know them. And then thirdly, they follow me. <laughs> That's all, all three of those involve action, don't they? All three of those involve the will. They involve the mind, they involve the heart or the affections and the will. Our whole personality, our whole being is involved in a relationship and in a walk with the Lord Jesus. Even now, we're going to see him face to face, but we can enjoy these things even now in this life. In a sinful body that's in rebellion. Believe me, this body does not want to get up and spend time with the Lord. It wants to lay in bed under the covers, right? And this body wants to oppose and this body wants to exalt self instead of Christ. It's in opposition. That's an enormous thing for a young Christian to come to understand that this body and this little inner voice that we're used to responding to is against us because it's against Jesus Christ now. Once we become a disciple of the Lord. Don't trust self. Trust Christ. Trust the word of God. And it's unfortunate the self, the old self-life, responds to the world system, responds to the impulses of the world, and the world system knows it because it's under the direction, as Matt said, of the prince of the power of the air. And he is controlling it for now, the usurper, the one who usurped dominion from Adam and Eve. As Mike said, that dominion is coming back when we reign with Christ just as we were created to do. And then you notice he says in verse 27 and verse 28, and I give them eternal life and they shall never. Good. never perish. And look at the picture he adds, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Who would dare to do such a thing? Thieves and robbers. They climb up some other way, not through the door of the fold, right? Religion. Religion, that's what the thieves and robbers use, yeah. The stranger, with his strange voice, will try to seek us and lead us away. But no one, ultimately the wolf, evil one, Satan, would like to snatch us. You know how bad he wants to snatch you out of the Lord's hands and me? He can't make it through one living day without desiring to snatch you and me out of Jesus' hands. That's how much he hates us. Because he's not getting dominion forever. His dominion is limited. <laughs> and he knows it. But he says, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. By the way, verse 28 and 29, John chapter 10, and every theology book you might consult are probably number one on the list under the title, Eternal Security. These are the two strongest verses we have. There are other verses in the Bible, even in chapter six of John, but here, these are the two strongest verses we have on eternal security. Like someone has said, if you have eternal life, you can't lose it. Otherwise, it's not eternal. It was temporary. <laughs> but then the fact that the shepherd himself, the Lord Jesus says, no one can snatch you out of my hand. 
Well, that's enormously important if we're going to live for Him, if we're going to be children of light and expose the evil around us. I wouldn't want to do that if I could lose my salvation, would you? If you're always worried about any decision I make, and this is where we have some places and some families struggle with this, where, where the leadership of the family, the leadership of a corporation, they're scared to death to make a decision because they don't want to make the wrong one. So they make no decision, but no decision is a decision. And there are consequences to that one too. But we can take positive steps because there's no way we can sin ourselves out of eternal life. We're going to make mistakes. We're not perfect yet. We don't always think in the right way. We won't always make the best choice. But he says, I will never condemn you. Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from that old law of sin and death that I used to be under. So you realize if you're born again here this morning, you have eternal life now as much as you will ever have it. You already have eternal life. I didn't say your body is going to be eternal, and I wouldn't want this one to be eternal. I want a glorified one where there's no pain in crying and bacteria and viruses that can eat out and all those kind of things. But we already have eternal life, and that gives us a confidence. That gives us a boldness. That gives us an assurance. That gives us a security. And you can't live the Christian life without it. If you live the Christian life in fear of torment all the time, you won't do anything. You won't ever leave the house. We have to know this, and that's why our Lord is asserting it and why John the Apostle was led in writing his fourth gospel to include this, because this is only, this section of the Feast of Dedication, again, is only in the Gospel of John. But then our Lord adds this in verse 29, My Father, who has given them to me, He's already introduced that concept in chapter 6. That we, believers, in the church are a gift from the Father to His Son. You ever thought of yourself that way? And may we put it this way reverently, the Father's no, as we used to say, Indian giver. No offense to the Indians. But that we used to use that expression. In other words, that gives and then takes back. He gives and gives. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. Is there anyone who would dispute that? That would include greater than Satan, greater than the principalities and powers that are the demons associated. Now Satan and the principalities and powers will want you to think that they're greater than the Father. This is what the Word of God says. I'm going to believe the Word of God. My Father who's given to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So I am holding you in my hand as the great shepherd of the sheep, and my Father is holding you in. So you're safe. You're safe in the Lord. And then that leads him to say again in verse 30, one of the great statements of his deity, I and my Father are one. What happened when he said that in chapter 8? <laughs> they picked up stones to stone him. What do you think they're going to do here? They haven't learned much in two months. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Remember chapter 8, it was in verse 59, if you want to see it for yourself. And so verse 31 to 39 now, our Lord comes back to dealing with these who are unbelievers. And they... I'll tell you, our Lord is so patient. <laughs> I wouldn't be this patient with him. 
Our Lord has already said they're not of his sheep. So he knows they're not going to respond. But he still invites them. He still reaches out. That's the heart of God. He knows they're not going to respond. He knew Judas was a devil. And he stayed right there amongst them. The whole three and a half year ministry up until just before the Lord's Supper. <laughs> After Passover, but before the Lord's Supper, he's excused, you see. And told to go do what he has already made up in his mind he's going to do. That'll be in chapter 13. But here in verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works I've sh I love the Lord's logic here. You talk about logic. Here is the master of logic, God himself, who made your brain and mine. He says, many good works I've shown you from my father, but which of these are you trying to stone me? Which miracle that I've done? The healing of the blind man? The, the healing of the lame man at the, at, the, at the gate there? The healing of all these different people and raising the, the son of the widow of Nain? And which one, which of these good works are you wanting to stone me for, huh? You know what he, see what he's showing them? He's saying, not only are you illogical in your reasoning, but your reasoning is twisted. It's bent. And you can't reason, ultimately, with a lost person. Because sin has twisted it. They need to be born again. Don't try to reason and argue with a lost person because it'll be futile. Our Lord demonstrates that here. Just present the truth, take them to the scripture and let the Holy Spirit do the work in their hearts with the word of God. If you don't have a Bible handy, quote scripture. To me, it's all, I've always found it best to show them in their own Bibles if they have one, rather than read your own Bible. You want them to be able to find it later in their own Bible. So what are they going to answer? Verse 33, again, they're playing this game. The Jews answered saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself Elohim. You make yourself God. By the way, and this is a great section to take Jehovah's Witnesses to. They don't like you to go to this section chapter 10 or in chapter 8 because it's so clear of the deity of Jesus Christ. He's not a creature, he's a creator. How are the Jews interpreting his statement in verse 30, I and my father are one? Is there any doubt in how they're interpreting? They're, they are interpreting his statement you are saying you are God. And he is. Hold your finger here and turn over to Colossians chapter 1. We could go to Hebrews chapter 1. We could go to 1 Peter. There's so many other places. But Colossians chapter 1, one of the clearest statements, chapter 1 of Colossians. You remember it's right after Philippians and before 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 1, verse 15. He, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. If he's over all creation, he's not part of it, is he? <laughs> and look what he says in verse 19, still in chapter 1. For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell. All the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ made you. He made every cell in your body. He knows the interworkings of every component of your being and mine. Look over at chapter 2 in verse 3 in whom Jesus Christ are hidden most of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want to have wisdom and knowledge? It's going to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. See? And then still in chapter 2, verse 9. 
For in him, Jesus Christ, dwells most of the fullness, all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you, believer, are complete in him. <laughs> so you don't need to supplement your relationship with him with some sort of religious ceremony. You're complete in him. And he is God. Wow. Now put that in when you think of him dying on the cross. Huh? The God who made us. Willing to die for us. He's already said earlier. You remember in verse 17 and 18 of chapter 10 in John. I have authority. To lay down my life. And I have authority to take it up and raise it from the dead. I already know what I'm going to do. The Romans didn't conquer me when they nailed me to the cross. The Jewish religious leaders didn't conquer me when they gave me to the Romans to be crucified and said, we have no king but Caesar. They said, oh. I was voluntarily, lovingly, self-sacrificially laying down my life for you. What a God. <laughs> so don't lower him. Don't let the world system lower him. He is that great. So coming back to John chapter 10. For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you being a man, if he was only a man, he was blaspheming. And they would be right to stone him according to the law. But he is God. And, but look at how he answers them. Verse 34. He goes to a, for most of us, we'd probably say an obscure psalm. Psalm 82. I would have never thought to do this. <laughs> this is the majesty of the wisdom of God. He says, is it not written in your law, the law being representative of the Old Testament scriptures, I said you are gods. One statement in Psalm 82, it's verse 6. And if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the Lord himself affirms, and the scripture cannot be broken, by the way, if the scripture can't be broken, all the prophecies that are yet unfulfilled concerning the future and Antichrist and the tribulation, they're going to be not broken because he just said, he so determined to fulfill the scripture that he allows them to even give him the sock there. Remember when he was on the cross because that's in Psalm 22 or 69 and that's going to be fulfilled, you see. The scripture cannot be broken. Amen. So this, this psalm is actually, and I'll let you look at it on your own, but it's actually <coughs> the, the term gods with a small g is referring to the judges. Back in the time of the judges and the religious leaders that followed from the judges, they made judgments. They made assessments of legal, moral, religious cases that came before them. There was no king during the time of the judges, right? And so they were the ones, and they were in various districts around the land of Israel, and they were in a position of representing who? Elohim, God. And so the Word of God says that they were like God in that sense of making a ruling and a judgment, but they weren't doing it according to justice. They were doing it in an unjust way, oppressing the poor and the needy and rewarding the evil. And the Lord is condemning them. He says, you are gods, but you shall die like men. Said so That's not quoted here, but that's in the psalm. But our Lord just picks up on this one statement in verse 35. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I'm the son of God? I'm in a position of authority as a representative of God sent by the Father. 
It would be right to say, I'm the Son of God then. But look what he adds in verse 37. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. You need validation. That's why I'm doing the miracles. If these miracles I did were from Beelzebub, from Satan, as they were accusing him, then don't believe me. But if I do the works of my Father, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. He's still reaching out. And look at the response. Therefore they sought again to seize him. But he escaped out of their hand because his hour had not yet come. He wasn't going to be crucified at the Feast of Dedication. And he wasn't going to be crucified at the Feast of Tabernacles. He's going to be crucified at the Feast of Passover. That was the prophecy of God. Satan is trying to use these religious men who were his minions to de detract from the fulfillment of Scripture, just like he does today. So you see how condescending and loving our Lord is with those who are opposed to him, and he reaches out to them, but he doesn't change the truth for them. And then John concludes chapter 10 and verses 40 to 42 with a positive statement of those again who respond to him. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. And there he stayed. So he's going, here John is referring all the way back to chapter 1 verse 19. Remember when he began to talk about this ministry of John the Baptist in chapter 1? He's going all the way back there, and, that, and our Lord now is leaving Jerusalem. He won't come back to Jerusalem until April of 30 A.D. in the triumphal entry, riding on a donkey. He won't come back to Jerusalem during that time. And this is the area where he's going is called Perea in the Gospel of Luke, and so it's referred to his, his Perean ministry in chapters 13 to 17 in the Gospel of Luke uh, refer to this. And that's what occurs during leading up to chapter 11, verse 1. So our Lord is there, and notice the response, verse 41. What a contrast to the religious leaders who should have known better. Here is Messiah in their midst, and they're opposing him, wanting to arrest him, wanting to kill him by stoning him. Here he goes back to the area of Perea, which is, these would be, the people in Jerusalem would look down on these. These would be the Hellenistic Jews they're referred to as in the book of Acts. These were Grecian-influenced Jews. They were Jewish people along the area where modern-day Jordan is on the eastern side of the Jordan River. But, but they were considered by the religious people in Jerusalem as lower class but many came to him and said, John performed no sign, John the Baptist performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. So they're resting their faith on the testimony of John the Baptist and in our Lord's public ministry of three years up to this point. Now, why couldn't the religious leaders do that in Jerusalem? All the things that John said about this man were true, but they, they wouldn't believe. These people did, see? And many believed in him there. And so John finishes this section on a positive note. He'll move now a few months later into probably February, early March of 30 A.D. when we come to the story of Lazarus is being raised from the dead in the next chapter. Selective history led by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John is stringing together these accounts. And what's John's purpose in doing this? Remember chapter 20 verse 31? These things I have written that you might that's it, believe and know and follow our Lord Jesus. 
stay near, keep drawing near to Him. He is our life. Amen. And He's lovely. So, Father, we thank You for Your Son. We thank You for these windows, these pictures into His glory, into how awesome He is. And may it whet our appetites for wanting to draw nearer to Him and to proclaim Him more, to tell others how great He is while there's still time. The night is coming when no man can work. While it's still day, may we proclaim the message of His grace. Be with us as we travel home. Get us home safely. And we thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to be together with one another and with you this morning on the Lord's Day. We ask your blessing in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.